This is not easy. It's not meant to be easy. We're not hoping it will be easy, but it's worth doing. It's worth doing, and it's it's unusually hard for many of us in the times in which we live right now. No. No. Post-pandemic, post-everything else, so much fragmentation. Um, it's, it's an easy time for pastors to feel like this might be the year I quit. Hi, this is Ray Ortland. Welcome to You're Not Crazy, Gospel Sanity for Young Pastors. And I'm here with my friend, Sam Alberry. Hey, Ray. And thank you for joining us on this episode. This, uh, this podcast is, well, even pastors who aren't young are listening to it. Even those who aren't pastors are listening to it. Sam, how would you articulate your, your dearest hope for this podcast, the difference that this might make? Oh, right. Um, our longing is, my longing is only by God's grace that this might help many churches become more sensitive to the very kind of relational beauty that Christ leaves in his wake. Yes. Um, that we would, it might be one of the ways that helps us move away from churches that are in one sense doctrinally sound and yet very rigid and harsh and cold and actually help us to have churches where the very love of Christ itself feels like a felt reality. <laughs> wow, that is brilliantly stated. W well, we both believe in this fervently. Yeah. And we also want to say to pastors, um, we want to encourage them. Yeah. Um, this is not easy. It's not meant to be easy. We're not hoping it will be easy, but it's worth doing. It's worth doing, and it's, it's unusually hard for many of us in the times in which we live right now. Yeah. Post-pandemic, yeah. post everything else, so much fragmentation. Um, it's it's an easy time for pastors to feel like this might be the year I quit. Hmm. So let's stick together. Let's get through this together. Now, before we jump into finding rest for your soul, which is our topic for this episode, uh, let me ask you, Sam, uh, what is your favorite food? Well, you're not going to approve of it, but... um. It's Thai food. Oh my goodness! I no comment. Thai food, but what is interesting? Why do you like that? Well, I grew up Ray with with what you eat, which is meat and two <laughs> veg. Um, the most exotic we ever really ate when I was a kid probably was pizza. <laughs> um, so I just had never, and I didn't really go for spicy food or anything like that. I'd never encountered these other flavors and cuisines until my twenties, and I found myself in in. Thailand in my early 20s I was working for a Christian mission organization that was was doing work out there I was out there for a few weeks someone put food in front of me I started eating it and I was like I've never tasted this before what where is where has this been all my life mm. and it's the combination of of kind of a bit of spice a bit of sweetness um, a bit of citrus in there mm. oh wow it's good I'm so glad you enjoy it <laughs> <laughs> mine would be Janny's venison chili with cornbread. And her cornbread is not dry. It's moist mm. and so delicious. I have had some of Janny's venison chili. Is it not In fantastic? In fact, for lunch today, we had elk minestrone. Oh, gosh. So good. Dear Larry, did yeah. not die in vain. <laughs> Lawrence Elk. All right. So... Finding rest for our souls, Sam, here we are. We're like sprinters. We're hurtling down the track uh, at top speed, giving it our best, giving it our all. But we're not made of titanium, and we can't live at full stretch all the time. We must pull back and uh, be replenished and uh, experience rejuvenation for the next big push. Yeah. So uh, help us understand what... What is there, what wisdom from God do we have about finding rest for our souls in the course of the exertions of pastoral ministry? Yeah, it's, it's an urgent question. And even in the narrative of the Gospels, we see the need of it. Um, in, in Mark 6, verse 31, we're, we're told, um, Jesus said to his disciples, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Sometimes ministry feels like that. Mm -hmm. There's just no let up. The phone never stops ringing. The, the emails never stop coming. If we're thinking, I'll wait for a quiet moment, it never comes. 
And if if Jesus and the disciples needed to, to take a step back for rest, how much more do the rest of us? I mean, we see this pattern throughout the Gospels where Jesus will withdraw often to a desolate place just to get away from everybody else, have time with the Lord, with with the Father, um, and to kind of and to rest in himself. So <laughs> um I I I can't say, well I'm I'm you know, Jesus needed rest, but I'm I'm just too indispensable. <laughs> if it was okay for Jesus to withdraw and to to recharge, then it's certainly the world can definitely survive not having me around in the saddle for a few hours or a day or two. Mm. Rest is built into reality because the 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 fourth commandment of Exodus 20 to mm. keep the Sabbath day, uh, the, the rationale for it goes all the way back to the creation. Yeah. And so the the pattern of human flourishing includes periodic rest. This is not this is not a forsaking of the call of God. It is a part of the call of God. Yeah, and it's not just a part of the fallen world. But that's a great point. I'd never thought of that. This is pre-fall. Yeah. This is God rest, resting, it says. Wow, that's really striking. Okay. And it means that, and this is such a danger for, for so many of us, because we believe in what we're doing, because we feel the urgency of what we're doing, it, it's hard for us to stop. Um, it's never convenient to, to stop. And there's a bit of us that feels like we're being heroic if we just keep going. And if we're working, it's very easy, right? I've, I've seen this time and again. There, there can be ministry cultures where unless you are working ridiculous hours and are constantly exhausted, you're just not pulling your weight. Mm. Um, and so there's this kind of almost silly macho thing where how many hours are you working? Well, I'm going to work more than that because I'm really committed. That's so foolish. And, you know, we, God is so merciful. I think, for example, of uh, 1 Kings uh, 18 and 19, Elijah has that dramatic uh, confrontation on Mount Carmel with the prophets mm -hmm. of Baal, and God demonstrates his glory uh, in a wonderful way. It's a huge win for the gospel. And uh, not after, not long after that, Elijah collapses. Yeah. And he went from this high point into kind of curled up on the floor in the fetal position. Yeah. And in that weakness, the Lord met him and came to him and spoke to him very profoundly and invested in Elijah for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So even when Elijah was unwise and running from life and from ministry. Uh, God, uh, that was not the end of his ministry. God took him to a deeper level. So we don't have to rest perfectly yeah. for this to be a ministry of God to us. Uh, he's, he's very merciful in that way. It, it's striking to me, Ray, that very episode, that it's, it is after that big spiritual high point, climax, intensity. It's after that that the, cr the crash happens. And it, I, I see that rhythm on a much smaller scale in, in my own life, that often it's it's Monday where the pastor is most despondent. Mm -hmm. After the sort of all the exertion of the previous day, Monday is where the self-doubt, the second guessing, yes. the self-loathing kicks in. And it's easy to think, Lord, I'm, I'm failing at everything. Why have you put me in this situation? Where are you anyway? And, you know, everything can look very bleak. So it, there's something very telling, almost reassuring that it's it's after such a spiritual high that Elijah has that that complete crash. And if memory serves, I've not looked at the, the text for a little while, but um, am I right in thinking the very first thing God does for him is just, is just feeds him? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't sort of give him a, you know, four-hour speech right away, just tends to his physical needs. Our Lord is the best boss to work for in the whole universe. <laughs> he understands us. Yeah. He accepts us. He's not depending on us, but he's coming through for us, feeding us, for example, giving us space to rest. 
one of the reasons why it's hard for us to accept the humility of rest and rejuvenation is not only, as you say, this sort of strange grandiosity we allow into our minds, mm-hmm. our, our feelings of indispensability, but also the very opposite, feelings of shame, mm-hmm. feelings of futility, of defeatedness, of failure. Monday thinking, no one is going to come back to this church next Sunday. Yeah, Not after my sorry performance yesterday. And that profound sort of devastation, feelings, we become exhausted not just from exertion, but from a fear of uh, feelings of futility yeah. that no matter how hard I try, I'm not making any difference at all. And that feeling itself is exhausting. Yes, it is. So we have to find every pastor, if he's married in conversation with his wife, has got to find a way to enter into renewal mm-hmm. on a regular basis. I think this is Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation mm. uh, with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you. Figure it out for yourself. It's, it's like appetite, like Thai food mm. might or might not work. Yeah. And my form of renewal and rest and rejuvenation might not work for you. But God has a way for every one of us to give ourselves permission to let God be God mm. and to let ourselves be needy and enter into renewal. Yeah, it's, it's theologically significant, isn't it, rest? Um, it's, it's not unspiritual. It's not, I'm taking my foot off the Christian pedal for 24 hours. Actually, it's part of our spirituality. Mm. Uh, we, we, we've misunderstood Christian spirituality if we sort of feel as though rest is this necessary evil, this necessary pause in between the real stuff. It is part of the real mm, stuff. That's really profound. I wish we had more retreat centers, places where... I remember, Sam, when I was a pastor in Oregon, for example, there was a Catholic... I think seminary slash retreat center not far away. Mm. And regularly I would go out there and for almost nothing in terms of cost, I could be in this simple, spare, even Spartan room and be alone and quiet. And still I would bring a notebook and I would, with my Bible, I wouldn't bring any work, wouldn't bring a laptop. And I would spend time with the Lord, reading scripture, journaling, then taking a walk, Coming, coming back, having a nap, reading scripture, journaling, taking a walk, and so forth. I came back from those days deepened and refreshed. I never once returned thinking that was a waste of time. Yeah. And the, the, the previous two churches I've worked at, the nearest place to do that were also Catholic places. Hmm. Um, I, I wonder why there aren't more reformed retreat centers i'm sure there are some out there and i don't know about them mm-hmm. um but i wonder if it says something of a of a neglect in our thinking in our theology and our spirituality that it's often the catholic ones that we end up having to go to that's so interesting because reformed theology does not dispense with the 10 commandments no but uh relocates them within the go- framework of the gospel and god's grace but the fourth commandment remains there Reformed theology doesn't, but I think maybe reformed culture does. Yeah, and we can be very activist, and unless I'm out there swashbuckling for the gospel, that's the only thing that matters. Now, how crazy is that? That people with reformed theology would not have a culture that builds in rest. Because part of the reason we rest is precisely because we believe in the sovereignty of God. Yes. Uh, tell us that Victor Hugo quote. You often tweet this when you go to bed at 7 p.m. each oh, night. Oh, yeah. Victor Hugo, great quote. Go to sleep in peace. God is awake. And I have that on a sort of a graphic. I love to tweet that toward the end of a day, mm. uh, not infrequently, because we need to be told for a theological reason to go to sleep in peace. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, it's a sign of our our confidence in God that we can. Yeah. Ray, I've mentioned this text before once or twice, but I I, I always keep coming back to it in, in Mark 4, the parable of the growing seed. Uh, it's a lovely short one. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is 
as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, he sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows, he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear, and so on. And I love that verse, that, that parable, because it shows me there, there are two things we do if we believe in the power of the word of God. One is that we scatter the seed, hmm. because that's where the power is. That's, it is the word of God that will, will accomplish the work of God. So that's why we, we preach the word. But the other thing we do, if we really have confidence that the power is in the word, is we can then sleep. Hmm. Because the word is the thing that is at work. I don't I don't have to be at work the whole time. Hmm. I can I can sow the seed and then I can sleep and know that it will be doing the work for which God has 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 brought it forth in the first place. Thank you for pointing that out. I don't think I've ever seen that so clearly. The sleeping is not incidental to the point of the parable. It is material to the point of the parable. Yeah. So the, the farmer sows the seed, then he sleeps, and the earth brings forth? Is that what it is? The it's earth saying? produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear. So what the parable doesn't say is a man should scatter seed on the ground, and then he sits on the ground by the seed, staring at it, speaking to it, trying to coax it out of the ground. Obsessing over it. Yeah, fretting. Um, <laughs> now, he, he can go to bed because from that point, nature will do what nature does. And this, the, the earth by itself will produce um, will produce the, the harvest. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like this? Yeah. Now, that, that's not all we have to say about ministry. It's not, I'm sure. not saying we preach a sermon and then sleep for six days and then preach a sermon and then sleep for six days. But it means that we we can rest because it's not ultimately down to us. We don't make people Christians. We don't grow them as Christians. Mm. Um, God amazingly does that. He chooses to do that for some reason through the ministry of his servants. Um, but it means that actually it's okay for me to go to bed because the power is in the seed and and, and by itself it will produce the crop. I don't need to be. I don't need to follow every congregation member home and keep re-preaching the sermon to them and bantering them. And have you understood that bit yet? Wow. Um, I I can let the word do its work. I can have a nap on a Sunday afternoon. Therefore, proper rest is a matter of humility. It it is. It's a matter of it. it it's an expression of faith. Hmm. Otherwise, what we can be saying by not resting is. I don't trust this stuff to happen unless I'm doing it. Wow. Maybe we could actually be, you know, legit reformed and believe <laughs> in the sovereignty of God. And when it's appropriate, step away, take a break, be refreshed. Ray, just sort of on a week-to-week -week basis, and, and with the caveat you've already given us that it's different for each person, what are some of the things that help you find refreshment? I find refreshment taking a walk with my wife, listening to great music. I almost, I'm to my own amazement, I almost never listen to 60s oldies anymore. I mean, I, I almost, I listen almost entirely exclusively to classical music because it resonates with my soul hmm. and I, I feel lifted up by it. So taking walks with Jenny, listening to great music, um, and then, of course, I'm sorry, but getting out into the woods, yep. hunting, hiking, doing physical manual labor, mm. clearing a shooting lane, putting up a new tree stand, exerting myself physically. Uh, what do you do, Sam, that re is rejuvenating for you? Many of those things, one or two significant exceptions to that. Um, <laughs> but I, I love hiking. I love being out in, in nature, walks with friends, um, getting lost in a piece of music, um, cooking a meal, hmm. um, cooking a meal for someone else. I, I love doing that. I, I just find that that seems to utilize all the bits of my brain that I don't normally get to use during the week. Hmm. Um and there's something about being out in the in the countryside. Uh, one writer, it might have been Wendell Berry, but if not, someone like that, said that the Bible is an outdoors book. Hmm. So much of the Bible is is about 
na- you know, outdoors and nature. The parables are all outside. That's not, you know, the, the kingdom of God is like a man sitting on his couch and watching TV. <laughs> so there's there's wow. something about being outside and in nature that that is always refreshing to me. Even if it's a rainy day, I'll still stick on my, I'm English, I'll stick on my coat and go for a walk. The exteriority of things is psychologically healthy. Yeah. Noticing that. Yeah. Connecting with that, getting outside my own. Yeah, the world is still there. Yes. And it didn't need me to be fretting for it to be there. And it's waiting to be enjoyed all over again. Yeah, you've you've used a phrase um, in the past, the there-ness of it. There's something about the thereness of of the natural world that is helpful to to recalibrate us. Well, thank you, Sam. That's very very helpful. Okay, what Crossway is the publisher, Crossway Books, who sponsor uh, this podcast. We're grateful to Crossway. Yeah, we trust them and respect them. We do. We we revere the work that they do. And Ray, I was going to ask you. We in the previous season, you had mentioned that your new book, The Death of Porn, was shortly to release. Right. It has since released. Uh, tell us how how that's going, the kind of feedback you're getting. Just give us a quick synopsis about right. the book first. and then A consistent theme, Sam, I'm getting in response to the death of porn is uh, Christian men gathering small groups of other men together to read this one chapter at a time and discuss it together very honestly and in candor and in uh, confidentiality together. I just think that that's how that book really works and really helps. It is so freeing to sit down with a Christian brother and prompted by a book like that, have, have a serious conversation about what isn't working in my life yeah. and how I'm not doing well and pray together. It is, that is when everything starts getting better. Yeah in that kind of conversation. So I'm seeing it happen and I'm very grateful. We've seen that the fruit of that already at Emmanuel, haven't we, with, with yeah. our men's ministry and seeing groups of men, including young men, young teenagers, getting into those conversations and the, the mutual dignifying that is going on in those conversations, um, men lifting one another up. It's, it's beautiful. It's very powerful. So thank you, Ray, for writing that. Thank you, Crossway, for for publishing it and for for helping us and encouraging us in this podcast. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. 